Good morning. I want to share a little bit of my story with you this morning. And it starts uh, with me waking up uh, in the middle of the night, which is something that happens every once in a while. Uh, It was actually day seven of waking up in the middle of the night. After the third night, I figured I must be fighting some kind of spiritual battle, a very noble thought about myself. Uh, But by the seventh, I knew that what I was fighting was actually myself. See, I was just finishing up Bible college. I was busy helping get a church plan off the ground. I was working two jobs just so I could finish well in that season. And for me, life was full of really good things. But the truth was, I was tired. I had been giving and giving for years, and it was all I could do to keep my eyes fixed on that next season. And I could practically taste those evenings without schoolwork or some kind of ministry event that I was obligated to. I was excited to be normal, whatever that meant. But this sleep interruption was throwing off my vision. So I wondered, what did God want? What else could he be after in my life? And I don't know why it took me so long to figure it out. But by the seventh night, I found my mind racing back to a letter I had received just a few days earlier. The letter was from my mom for my birthday, and it was the first time I had heard from her in years. And after reading it, I immediately resolved to not meet with her, which was her request in the letter. There were too many years lost, too much pain and disappointment and confusion. She didn't deserve it, and I... I was riddled with the weird and confusing cocktail of both desire and fear, so the answer had to be no. As I laid there in the darkness of the dorm room I was in, all the emotions raced back to me as I thought about reading those words in that letter. And somehow, in the midst of the noise and the chaos of my soul, I heard a faint whisper of a familiar voice. It was an invitation, to be exact. Give me what you have. What I have? I have nothing. I have years of a broken heart and confusion as to why she didn't want me. Give me what you have and let me bless it. Trust me with it. I heard again. And I immediately knew what that meant. I knew it meant risk and confronting some of my greatest fears. I knew it meant coming up against all of my limits, both in that season and of my soul. I knew it meant coming to the end of myself and surrendering more. All I thought was, I can't do that. And what would it matter anyway? The miracle of fixing this relationship was impossible, it was ridiculous, it was illogical. And in all honesty, I wasn't sure I had it in me to do the work. I was fine, I had enough. I was doing enough, and honestly, I had given enough. Giving him what I had now would mean giving him broken pieces of a story that was riddled with shame, hers and mine. So I laid there and gave God my best arguments, which are extraordinary, by the way. And I did so as a theological student. I thought I'd give God the what for. And I told him how silly this conversation was, and I did this until the sun began to break into the window of my room. And then finally, when I had run out of words, I heard him say again, give me what you have and trust me. Hot tears ran down my face and in that small dorm room with the somewhat violent and not so subtle breath patterns of my roommate next to me, (laughs) without any idea of what this would mean or cost me or what it would become. I said, okay. Now, as most of you know, you've been in a series on Ephesians where you've been talking about what it means to be the church, to be vintage church, to be people who actually reflect the goodness of God and the truth and power of what it means to carry his life within you. And last week, Gare talked about this power, how it's rooted in the sacrifice of Jesus. And it's through that sacrifice that we have found life with God, yes, but also life with one another. God's life, Jesus' death, 
as Gare reminded us, destroys the barriers within us and between us. And it makes us into something miraculous, the church. This is the great story he said that we're all caught up in and it's the story we want to invite others into. And so today I want to build on what he talked about last week. I want to unpack some of the layers of how we actually become people who are more like Jesus, but also people who are experiencing the reality of the life of God and one another in the way that we were always meant to. So because Gary told me that I could, we're going to hit pause on Ephesians today. I'm the big guest speaker. And instead, we're going to pick up in a story that I would imagine is familiar to a lot of you. It's a story that has historically been famous for the miracle that takes place within it. But today, I want our attention to be on another equally significant part of the story. So if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to do a bit of a pivot here. It's kind of nice. You need a break anyway, am I right? <laughs> Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians. Now, I'm going to go a little old school today. Is that okay? I grew up Baptist. Anybody else? Yeah, some of you are like, we're recovering. I know. Uh, grew up Baptist. So we're going to go chunk by chunk in the text. Is that okay? We're going to give you the what for with the biblical uh, work. And then um, we're going to get to the good stuff. Um, and it's going to be important that we understand the story. So I'm going to need you just to track with me. I think you can do that. It feels good in this room already, doesn't it? Worship team got us warm. Whew. And so we're ready to go. All right, look down at verse 13. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. All right. Our story opens up today with Jesus just learning of John the Baptist's death. That's his cousin, if you didn't know. And just as we've seen Jesus do before, his response is to withdraw to a solitary place. It makes sense. But this time in the solitary place would be short-lived. Because in the second part of verse 13, we read that the crowds, completely unaware of Jesus' pain or his grief or his stress, actually follow him from the towns to the deserted place. Thanks, but no thanks. And listen, they come, and they don't just come, but they come with needs. As soon as Jesus lands on the shore, he sees them, and his reaction, in my opinion, is nothing short of remarkable, because he isn't angry, he isn't frustrated, he isn't avoidant like I would be. Instead, we read that he is full of compassion. N.T. Wright describes the moment this way. He says, before the outward and visible works of power and healing the sick comes the inward and invisible work of power in which Jesus transforms his own feelings into love for those in need. Jesus' own vulnerability seems to be the gateway for compassion. It's from this place of compassion that we find him doing what he has done time and time again. He heals the sick. In the middle of his time of need, he continues to care for those who need him the most. Now, eventually the day wears on and we find Jesus' disciples doing what any of us do when we're trying to wrap up a long day at work. We try to get things moving so we can go home. And that is just what they did. Look at verse 15. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's getting late. So send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Now, there seems to be a hint, of impatience, a hint of impatience here and maybe even fatigue in the disciples' tone. At least that's how I read it because that's how I would feel. They essentially tell Jesus what to do. The disciples kind of get up on their horse and say, listen, bud, here's what we're going to do going forward. Now, some might call this hangry behavior. I'm no expert. <laughs> Just ask my family. <laughs> but whatever it is, it's important to note their disposition here. As they spoke to him, they were in so many ways saying, look, we've been at this for a while. There are too many people here, and they won't go home and eat unless you tell them to. Now, historically, we know that it isn't likely that so large a number of people would have been able to actually buy enough food in the villages to this deserted or wilderness place to actually meet their needs. The people would have had to bring their own provisions, brought their own sack lunches. So the disciples aren't all wrong here. They're taking their circumstances at face value. Because what else can they do? 
the weight of a female preacher. This is the life that we live. Now, Jesus apparently has something to say here. Without losing his sense of reality, he responds and says, no, they don't need to leave. You give them some food. Now, the disciples are undoubtedly and understandably baffled and respond and say in verse 17, we have here only five loaves, Jesus, and two fish. You do the math. They show Jesus what they've got and they say, this is it. This is all we have. And you can almost hear their protest. There are no questions of like how or even why. And it doesn't seem they're interested in much of a conversation. Perhaps they're just simply perplexed or maybe they are frustrated. Either way, it's clear that what they had was not enough. And in this moment, we see Jesus placing a demand on them that they are clearly incapable of fulfilling. And despite all that they had seen him do, like many of us would, they stay locked in on their own perspective and their own limitations. Maybe it was the simplicity of the need that blinded their ability to actually believe something could happen. I mean, we're just talking about dinner here. And while we can't say for sure, despite their unbelief and exasperation, Jesus, in kindness, responds to them. And he says in verse 18, bring them here to me. And he directed the people then to sit down on the grass. So taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. Now notice here that the disciples weren't called to creatively dream up or conjure up some strategic plan for charitable action. They were simply asked to give what they had. To surrender the meager provision and then let him do the rest. And while it may seem that they do this with little faith, the truth is they still do it, even at a cost to themselves. Scholar R.T. France beautifully describes what their giving entails when he says, to surrender even this meager provision to Jesus was either an act of reckless obedience or evidence of a more confident faith in Jesus' problem-solving ability than we have seen the disciples displaying elsewhere. Still uncertain and perhaps even clueless of the outcome, the disciples hand over their food and with it a possible forfeit of what they have to benefit someone else. And then we read that dinner is served. Now, Jesus directs the people to sit down and essentially he prepares them to eat. Bum, bum, bum. Big faith moment, yeah? Here are five things. Here we go. Everyone take a seat. We're about to eat. And he welcomes them to the table. Now, in the Greek, this word direct is understood as a command. So he commanded them to sit. And sit here actually translate to lay or lounge. This is a position in the first century that people would have taken when they were coming to eat a meal at a banquet or a feast. So Jesus is unpacking a bit of more of what he's after. And the picture we see here is one that is both prophetic and familiar. With authority and hospitality on display, Jesus sets the stage both for dinner and the miracle. And it's amazing to me how most of his miracles involve these two things, the limits of his people and the welcome of the other. Jesus then gives thanks and he breaks the loaves. In other words, he blesses it and he breaks the bread. This is language we'll hear again in this book, but around a different meal. And then we read that after doing this, he gave the food to the disciples and the disciples serve the people. Now, this act may seem simple and practical, even as we're reading it, it just kind of feels like, well, of course. But it's important to see that Jesus is not only inviting the disciples to participate in the meal, but to also share in the miracle itself. And through that, something incredible happens. Look down at verse 20. They all ate and were satisfied. And the church said, amen. No one likes to eat here? Amen. We're ready to eat. I like, that's, okay. It's a miracle where I come from. Let's eat and be satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left. And the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides the women and children, which we know that math would be about 10,000 people. So boom, just like that. With no lightning, no thunder, no singing angels, everyone eats. And again, a miracle in my book. And in fact, we read that that these people ate and were satisfied. This meal wasn't just sufficient. It didn't just curb the appetite. It was, as we read it, a filling to the brim experience. Jesus' provision went beyond any normal comprehension or even faith-filled expectation. We read that the disciples picked up 12 
leftovers of broken pieces of food, language that points us back to the initial small, meager meal and the depth and the breadth of the miracle he performed from it. Painting for us a picture not only of his provision, but the grandiosity of the miracle itself. Now, when we read this story, this is where we usually end. Like, well done, Jesus. Some people were fed. Another miracle in the book for him. And that's where we end it. But I believe there's something more for us to see in this. And maybe even better said, another invitation for us. And in particular, for those of us who are trying to follow Jesus. Because if we look closely, we'll see that the disciples, some of the main characters in our story, are actually carrying forward a significant narrative that's often missed or minimized in the shadow of the miracle that just took place. You see, the disciples, while a messy and certainly unrelatable lot, a lot of times, are meant to, in this story, invite us in. To find ourselves in the faces and the attitudes of the one who are with Jesus. And it's not too hard. I mean, if you've been following Jesus for a while, you won't have to reach too far to identify with their circumstances. (laughs) I mean, I imagine and I honestly believe that there are some in here today who know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been walking with Jesus, grateful for what he's done, but there is a fatigue in your heart. And in that, a waning faith for what could be in your own life and even in the lives of this community. And if that's you even a little bit, then this is your invitation You see, in this story, we find disciples who are with Jesus at the end of themselves. They're exhausted. They're tired. They're overextended and honestly disinterested in the people's needs. They're struggling to see what comes out of their own limits, out of their surrender. Struggling to see the miraculous work of Jesus. The disciples had been serving people. They had been helping people get to Jesus. They had been doing good and faithful work. And then another need arises. And they find in their lap, as we often do when it comes to the family of God, no offense, but another need, another person to care for. I'm in the family too, so I get it. That wasn't a dig. We're all in it. And so we find them in this space doing the over and above work. The extra work that feels costly and honestly doesn't feel that important when you're that fatigued. And yet, amidst all of this, we find Jesus calling them to more. At the end of themselves, he says, give me what you have. More, when they feel they don't have anything left. More, when they had their own needs. More, when they didn't know what to do next. More, when he, without words, invites them to trust him for what they need most. More. It's annoying. Isn't it? Following Jesus sometimes? I mean, at least when we don't understand what he's up to and what he's asking f- more about, you know? It's an- I mean, can we just say that? Can we- maybe it's just me. I need to go to Alpha, maybe. <laughs> but the truth is more is hard for most of us. Because more in American means cost. And cost is often something we try and avoid. Hello? Which for most of us means that when we find ourselves in this kind of moment with Jesus, there is a tension at play. Because what we can't miss is that more in the kingdom means something very different. And the tension of the more is often the appeal to us. It's an invitation to us to see and to experience and to know a greater reality that we're experiencing. To know the world in a different way. In our text, it would be easy for us to sit back and judge the disciples for their lack of faith and their overall bad attitude. To even see them as a hindrance to the meal that Jesus was providing and extending to the people. But what I think stands out even more distinctly in this text is Jesus' response to them. With every move the disciples make, Jesus makes another. And it's in his response that I think we see three really important invitations for us today. Three invitations for you, Vintage, today. And the first is an invitation to humanity. What I mean by humanity is the limits of our humanness. In our text, Jesus didn't seem put off by the disciples' desires, by their frustration with the people and with the situation. He didn't seem discouraged by their inability to see it as he saw it, to believe him for the miracle that he could even offer if they would just remember back to the times that he had done it over and over again. In fact, instead, we see him embrace them and meet them right where they were at. 
And the other thing he doesn't do is coddle them or patronize them, but neither does he shut them down or rebuke them for their humanity. This response from Jesus is an invitation for us to accept our limits and our humanity and to let that be the starting place of God's invitation to us. Now, to be clear, we don't use our limits as an excuse for bad behavior. Don't try that. Gary will get you. <laughs> we also don't use it as a, a space to have a lack of faith. But what I do want us to get is that there is a healthy reality for each of us to consider, particularly as we play our part in the kingdom and begin inviting others into it. And that is that there are no limits, that there are limits to our person. And ultimately in that, there's limits to our perspective. Limits to how we will see and even interpret what Jesus is up to in our lives and in the lives of other people. And the gift is to remember that through this invitation to our humanity, we are reminded of our actual place. He is God in heaven and we are here on earth. And there is something in that reality that many of us need to be reminded of. Something that can change us and even free us in the work of ministry that we're doing. In the work of serving in the kingdom that we're doing. Something that if we accept it, we could actually receive a lot more. Because here's the reality. The end of their humanness is where Jesus' godness could begin. And that's the same for us. The disciples probably couldn't have imagined the miracle that was coming their way. They just couldn't. But in the offering of what they had, bad attitudes and limits and all, they were able to not only experience the kingdom of God, but to participate in it. An invitation to our humanity. Next, we see there's an invitation to humility. Of course, born out of our humanity is always an invitation to humility. That's a fun lesson to learn as you're growing up. Humility in the kingdom can be divine, defined as a right view of ourself and a right view of God. But simply put, humility happens when we accept our humanity and allow it to change the way that we view the world. And we see this most clearly as the disciples begin to engage in the feeding. I mean... Can you imagine this moment, the thoughts and the feelings that were actually filling the disciples' minds as they were passing out food? Can you imagine Peter looking over and being like, John, what the heck? I mean, do you know what I mean? Like, and they're like, Pete. You know, just like, yeah, reach in there. I mean, you know, just like a real moment. What would you be doing? I'd be like, Here, I hope something's in there. You know, just what's inside there, what's happening as people are reaching in and thousands of people. I mean, after the first thousand, I think I'd be like, I'm an idiot. I mean, just, you know, like looking at Jesus and, you know, is Jesus just laying back eating a fish stick? Who knows? But I mean, what, I mean, seriously, what a moment. Can you imagine what was filling them as they began, they were participating in the mystery of the miracle and God begins to move. They didn't expect him to. They're like, we don't have anything. They're grumpy as crap. They're just, here, I mean, I hope there's something. I mean, you'll see Jesus. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, great. Costco size, you know. <laughs> Portions that people are getting. And they must have been like, what's happening? Their hearts must have felt upside down as they collected the leftovers. They were out there for hours. Have you ever fed 10,000 people on a, the side of a hill? <laughs> hours of walking back and forth, picking up the leftovers. What must they have been thinking? I had no idea. And a meal seemed small and meager. But it was probably something they remembered until their death. The feast on the hill. You see, something was happening to them as they yielded to God's invitation. To God's perspective. And that something was miraculous and tangible. The disciples thought they knew what reality was. They thought they knew what could happen or even should happen. They thought they knew what God was up to and what he was capable of, but they didn't. And in that moment, in that humbling moment, all of a sudden their sight shifted forever. This is now the God who feeds 10,000 people on a hillside. Through their humility, they were able to see what was actually true. Some of us now are in situations where we're realizing that we didn't know what we didn't know. But God did. And even though some of us still like to help God along, I love doing that. To give him our better opinions, which I'm sure he adores. 
there is something that will shift in us when we surrender, truly surrender our will to his. Without humility, without allowing ourselves to be changed by the reality of our limits, we may forfeit participating in the miracle God is wanting to work in us and around us and through us. Humility, particularly as we see it here, is the prerequisite. It's the on-ramp for experiencing all that is on offer through God. And it's usually much bigger than we can know. Finally, we see an invitation to harvest. I hate the word, it makes me cringe. I needed another H, if I'm being totally honest. <laughs> and uh, this word captured it, so here we are, totally embarrassed. But can you handle it? I'm going to keep my eyes down when we talk about it. <laughs> in our story, you'll notice that we don't know what the mir- that the miracle has happened until we find it in the hands of the disciples. Until we actually recognize that Jesus took what had been given, and then he actually gave what had been given back to the disciples. And then the miracle began. In that one act, we see Jesus inviting the disciples not only to participate, but to receive the gift that happens in those situations, when he's free to work, when he's free to create impos- our possibility out of impossibility. Now, historically, I think many of us know that, at least here, that God delights in shattering our pint sized expectations of who he is and what his followers can do. But I think sometimes it's harder to actually let that translate into our real life situations particularly in those places where we feel the most cost or we feel the most impossibility. In our story today, we see that Jesus' invitations to more always involves more. And not just for the one receiving the miracle, but also for the one participating in it. Jesus is a God who is able to give beyond expectations and beyond what our humanity outlines. He is lavish and ridiculous. He is outrageous. And the scriptures tell us that he is eager to give us more than we thought possible. And he doesn't want to do it alone. He invites you and me into it all, into all the bananasness, the craziness. This morning I'm standing on your stage because God wanted to invite me to do something with him that is outside of my means, truly. But here we are. This is the way that he works. And listen, this invitation to not do it alone, to, not, to, to, to move apart from the spirit of God, to move with him. This is the invitation of the church. This is our story. Our story doesn't demand we become some superhuman spiritual giants, although that would be nice. Instead, it simply demands that we allow our humanity to be the starting place of the miraculous work of God, both in us and through us. The work of the church, as you've been studying it, is to keep hearing this invitation to us. To keep risking and trusting God over and over again with our humanity, our small, meager provision of what we have to offer, and then to let that humble us, to give us right vision and sight for what he's doing, and then to be able to see and say yes to whatever the harvest is that he's going after. I think you know this, and I've been listening and following your community, and I really believe there is more here. I I told Gary, he came up to Portland a couple weeks ago, I just feel like you're at a threshold moment, a catalyzing moment, and your willingness to say yes is what will activate the miracle. I'll never forget meeting my mom a few weeks later after I had read the letter and wrestled with God. I showed up and offered Jesus what he had asked of me what I had, which, by the way, was a measly mix of distrust, a broken heart, and a ton of impossibility. And while it didn't seem like much, in fact, it seemed like what I had to offer was actually going to work against me. I can now see that from it came one of the greatest miracles of my life. What I thought my humanity hindered was the gateway to the gift. That day that I met with my mom marked the beginning of healing I never thought was possible. And an experience of God's kingdom that I had never known. It was from that that I truly learned that God raises the dead. He does the impossible work. He is the God of the miraculous. And 
that what he asks of us, a small meager provision that he asks of us is actually enough to change our lives and then also change the lives of those around us. That day, I saw that. And look, that is not the only story I've lived. That was a few years ago, now that I'm 21. <laughs> I keep living this story. Even now, today, I'm, I'm sitting in a space with my meager provision held out, waiting for God to do the miracle. And this is our story. And so I welcome it. Because I know the God of a miracle. I know the God who takes the smallness of what I have and makes something out of it that I could have never dreamed up or created. Now, if this story, if my story, the one we read today, sounds familiar to you in more than just a kind of flannel board, cartoon vegetable kind of way, <laughs> it should. Some of you are confused. Some of you need to share a bit more about your life with your community. <laughs> your upbringing. I just want to remind you that this miracle actually mimics the others that we find in scripture. There's a reverb that we find echoing all over the pages of the Bible. Stories like Elijah, a famous prophet in Israel who, when given 20 loaves of bread, fed 100 men and then had some left over. Or a more obvious example of people like Moses, who you know, part of the Red Sea, but he also led people to a miraculous place of provision, manna from heaven every day in the desert. Stories like these and the one today are meant to remind us that our story as God's people is always one of invitation. And to what God is calling us to is the miraculous work that comes from saying yes. So say yes to what God is moving and inviting you into even if it feels like it's impossible. Now, I'm gonna say some things in love because I love you and I've been praying for this time. And so I just want to speak some things out. And then, Gary, I'll kind of let you take the reins. Um, but I just, a few, few things that I want to encourage you with and maybe invite you into. As I was praying for this community and my time here, I sensed, again, like I shared earlier, that God was doing a new thing in, in the spirit of this community. And I could be way off. Some of you might be like, she has no idea. That's fine. You can keep that to yourself and have a nice smoothie after church today. But I just want to say three things. One, I sense that there may be some of you, in a, and in particular, some of you who are in spaces of leadership, who are fatigued and up against your limits. And I know it's audacious for some stranger to come in and say that, but I just sense the ministry of the Spirit uh, to want to pour out ministry over you. And in particular this morning, as I was praying during worship, I just felt like the Lord said there was a woman who had been injured from someone that she had been serving. So if that's you, I think the Spirit wants to minister to you and to bless you and to heal you today. So I, I sense that there's an invitation for some of you who have been leading for a while and that fatigue is there, that God just wants to bring renewal so you can carry this forward. I also sense that some of you need to be reminded of this invitation. And I know this sounds weird, but just I have a strong sense that someone this morning needs to hear, you are invited in. And it's in particular maybe to the person who has already disqualified themselves as I was talking. Who just said, look, I'm out. And maybe it's what Gary alluded to earlier. Maybe you had a rough week and the enemy's been lying to you about who you are. I just want to say the invitation is for everyone. So shut the enemy out and say yes. The invitation is extended to you with joy and anticipation this morning. And then finally, I just sense there's an invitation for people not to prejudge the offering. What you're offering, you, you don't have to quantify or qualify or understand. It's enough just to say this is it. This is it. This is what we're bringing to the table. And I just want to bless you to know that God delights in that. And it's almost as if he's laughing and taking you and breaking the bread and going, just wait. Just wait. So I want to pray God's blessing over you. Um, can I have them? Can I have you stand? I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm a pastor at a different church. We usually stand, get the old legs moving. And all I want to do, I just want to invite you to do this. Um, we just do, we open up our hands. I think you guys too, just as a posture of saying like, God, I'm open. And all I want to do is just bless you. And if you don't want to do that, feels too weird. Don't do that. It's totally fine. I just want to pray 
that God would, if those words are true, even if it's just for one person, it's totally worth it. But that God wants to bless and minister, minister to you. So Spirit of God, you're here. You're here as we, we spoke your name out like air. We just experienced the reality of your presence. And I pray, Jesus, that you would flood the imaginations and the minds and the hearts in this room with the reality of who you are. I pray, Spirit, that you would push out and dissolve and swallow up any lies of the enemy. That God would try to hinder the truth that you want to proclaim to this community today. I pray specifically for those who are weary. Come and bring your restoration, your peace and your healing. Thank you that you are the God who sees. Let's hear the Lord saying, I've seen it all. Thank you, Jesus, for your compassion. I pray, Father, that you would help us not to prejudge what we bring, but you'd give us the faith to yield all that we are, to lean into the more, and to trust you for the miracle that comes after. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you that you're so awesome, and you're so fun, and you're so wild and radical. We want to follow you. So give us the faith to do that now, we pray. Amen.